How can I be happy? What is a good life? How can I live my life so that I can fulfill my highest aspirations for myself and for others? Why do we have to suffer? Why are we born only to grow old, to get sick, and to die? Why are some people mean and nasty to each other? Does the world make sense? Or do things happen at random? What is the nature of reality? If God is good and powerful, why does He allow evil to exist? Can these questions be answered? And if so, through what channel? Many people don't think of a course in world literatures as a way to find the answers to these questions to the extent that we can find the answers. But in fact, a course in world literatures is the best possible place to look into because what literature records is the most comprehensive answers to these questions. Our course, however, will extend beyond the boundaries of quote-unquote literature. So if you're thinking of a usual run-of-the-mill one-semester course in literature, you can relax because this course is different, like a breath of fresh air, so to speak. Be prepared to broaden your horizons. In this new millennium, we need to be one with peoples and cultures of different belief systems and worldviews. We are tied together as a global community, so our course will transcend all boundaries, national, linguistic, ideological, political, and we shall embrace philosophy, economics, climate change, natural science, theoretical physics, and technology. Our ultimate purpose is to propose viable solutions to the problems of war, corruption, and poverty as we enlarge our vision and grow in wisdom through literature for the good of the world. So fasten your seat belts, sit back and relax, and allow me to take you on a tour around the world of literature. Our journey will begin in Sumer, in the Near East, in ancient Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, cradle of civilization, and cradle of one of the oldest literary works in the world, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is about a ruler who is half divine, whose boundless energy wearies out his subjects. He is the strongest, the bravest, the fastest, the smartest, the summa cum laude, the handsomest, who outruns, outthinks, outparties, outdrinks all his subjects. He is too much for the city. But when his friend Inkidu dies, he is horrified by the prospect of his own death. He may be half divine, but he is also human, and being human is enough to seal his fate. For all men are mortal, and all mortals must die. Why does he have to die, he asks. So he embarks on a search for eternal life. What he finds instead is wisdom. After Gilgamesh, our course will split into four parts. Part 1, entitled 
the people of the book will study the three great monotheistic faiths Islam, Christianity and Judaism. They are called people of the book because all call themselves children of Abraham and all three share an intense monotheism, a belief in one God, creator, sustainer, and ruler of the universe. This section will show that despite their differences, they are sibling religions with family resemblances that transcend ethnicity and geography. First, we shall study the Christian Bible as literature, a book best known for the many stories it contains, stories that encompass the entire sweep of narrative from Genesis to Revelation and Last Judgment. The grand opening of God creating the heaven and the earth. The story of Adam and Eve and their first transgression and banishment. Faithful Abraham, obedient to God, even when God commands him to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac. Moses parting the sea so that his people could escape certain death from the Pharaoh's soldiers. David slaying the giant Goliath. But the most important figure in the Christian Bible in which all history before him looked forward to and all history after him looked back to is the person of Jesus. In the New Testament, Jesus is portrayed teaching eternal truths by means of parables that are impressive for their wit, their brevity, and their eloquence. The parable of the prodigal son, Lazarus and Divas, and many others once heard are remembered forever. But the New Testament also contains stories about Jesus himself, casting out demons with a word, stilling a storm, walking on water, healing the sick with a touch of his hand, taking five loaves of bread and two fishes and feeding 5,000 people with such abundance that 12 baskets of fish and bread are leftovers. One of the most moving stories in the New Testament is the raising of Lazarus. Martha and Mary send a message to Jesus that Lazarus, their brother, is ill. When Jesus arrives in Bethany, however, Lazarus has already been dead and in the tomb for four days. Martha, hearing of Jesus' arrival, goes out of her house to meet him. Lord, she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus tells Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha says to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection and the last day. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Martha says, with tears in her eyes, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Jesus then asks to be led to the grave, and once there, orders the men to take away the stone. Martha says, But Lord, my brother has been dead four days. 
by this time he is already in the process of decomposition. Jesus says, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they roll away the stone, and Jesus, after thanking God the Father, calls forth, Lazarus, come forth! And Lazarus comes out of the tomb alive with great clothes and all but alive because Jesus the son of the living God has raised him from the dead the New Testament is filled with true stories of Jesus that show the reality of miracles the power of love after the Bible we shall study the Holy Quran, the literal, eternal, and uncreated Word of God revealed from heaven to the Prophet Muhammad through the angel Gabriel as a guide for humankind. The Holy Quran is central and pivotal to Islam. All Muslims regardless of their mother tongue, memorize and recite the Holy Quran daily in Arabic, the sacred language, the language of God. In this section, we shall also study the five pillars of Islam and the significance of jihad balanced by a very strong mandate for making peace. And then we shall study Judaism. The centerpiece of all Judaism is the Hebrew Bible, also called the Tanakh, a word based on the first letters of three Hebrew words, the Torah, or the five books of Moses, the Nevi'im, or prophets, and the Ketuvim, or scriptures. In this section, we shall also study the Talmud and the Haggadah, a book recited on the Cedar Night as Jews recount the story of the first Passover. Part 2 takes us to the other half of the world, the mysterious world of India and the Far East. Many people think of the Orient as a world of mystery and meditation. Because it is thousands of years old, Oriental literature encompasses a wide variety of belief systems with significant differences from one country to another. To demonstrate the common framework that runs throughout the literature of the East, is the intention of this section. We begin with India at the time when the Aryans came and brought with them the Vedas, an oral tradition composed in Sanskrit. And then we shall take up the Bhagavad Gita or the Song of the Lord, which is the story of a warrior's dilemma and the advice of the Hindu god Krishna to Arjuna, the warrior, who has to choose between his duty as a soldier and his fear that in killing he would create so much evil karma that will take many lifetimes to pay off. So he lays down his arms and refuses to fight. What would you do? if you were in his situation. And then we shall go to China, that vast and ancient land. China, whose geography is as large as its population. China is the world's oldest living civilization. Its history dates back to almost a million years ago 
to a time when it was believed flourished the Peking man, ancestor of the Chinese people. Many important wise men appeared in China. We shall take up two of them, Confucius, who gave us the Analects, and Lao Tzu, who wrote the Tao Te Ching. First, Confucius. For more than 2,000 years, the wisdom of Confucius guided the intellectual, political, and ethical life of China. The key to his teachings is the idea of right human relationship, guided by obligations, duties, and responsibilities, so that society might work. The family is seen as the most important facet of society, because it is the microcosm of how these relationships linked people together by means involving both hierarchy and reciprocity. On the other hand, Lao Tzu taught differently. The Tao Te Ching encourages us to connect not with culture and ritual, but with nature, the changes and rhythms of the universe. Close regulation of human relationships, says Lao Tzu, alienated humans from the Tao. In fact, rituals appear when people have departed from the way. The solution, therefore, is to return to the way. One of the most exciting features of this section, at least on my part, will be an actual demonstration by your teacher of the ancient art of Qigong, one of the practical applications of the Tao Te Ching that your teacher learned in China. He shall demonstrate how this is done for health, for mental keenness, and if you teach this simple yet ancient exercise to your parents and grandparents, for longevity, for long life of perfect health. The Analects and the Tao Te Ching are like the yin and yang symbol of Chinese harmony and wholeness. For Confucius, the Tao is the discipline and social harmony, rational. For Lao Tzu, it is the way of nature, intuitive. There is, however, another Chinese book that I would like to introduce to you in this course. It is less known, but no less important than the Analects and the Tao Te Ching. This book is Liao Fan's Four Lessons with a subtitle, How to Change Your Destiny. A little book that could actually change your life for the better. And my objective is to show you in four easy lessons why and how you can change your destiny. Watch for this and change your destiny for the better. We shall now go to Japan, the island country off the East Asian coast. Our lecture here will study these honorable people by examining Japanese Zen, which is a mispronunciation of the Chinese word Chan, which in turn is a mispronunciation of the Indian word Jhana, which means concentration or meditation. Zen is a discipline which emphasizes enlightenment through transmission from teacher to student, usually without the use of words. Once upon a time, the Buddha, instead of giving a lecture, held up a flower in silence and smiled. The monks waited for him to speak, but the Buddha merely smiled. Nobody could interpret what is meant. One monk 
by the name of Kashyapa, gazed at the flower and smiled back broadly at the Buddha. The Buddha handed him the flower and Kashyapa became enlightened. This was the birth of Zen. From China and Japan, we shall go to Tibet, the roof of the world. Tibet is a vast plateau region situated about 15,000 feet above sea level. It is the highest region in the world and its temperature can fall as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius with heavy snows and fierce winds. There we shall study the Tibetan Book of the Dead, a text recited over the dying or the recently dead to help the patient attain liberation. We shall also offer helpful suggestions and explain why it is not advisable to touch the patient or to cry in front of the patient or to embalm, to cremate, or to bury immediately after clinical death. Death is not a pleasant topic of conversation, but it cannot be ignored. The Tibetan Book of the Dead prepares us properly for the inevitable to make us realize that death is as natural as birth. A special section entitled Literature and Social Change will discuss Das Kapital as Literature. Das Kapital is a three-volume analysis of the history and direction of capitalism, a system Karl Marx describes as exploitative in nature and the cause of so much poverty and alienation of the industrial working class or the proletariat. The social background of Marx's book is that of Victorian England in the best of times and the worst of times. The worst of times because the social conditions in the factories were exploitative. Women and children pulling coal out of mines, children as young as nine years old working 12 to 15 hours a day in the textile mills, tubercular workers waiting their turn to rest in beds that never got cold. Is our description any different from the plight of our call center agents? We shall study how Das Kapital paints a searing portrait of the degradation of labor in the industrial factory. We shall also show how Marx will not only prove why his scientific socialism is better than utopian socialism, he will show us how it actually works for philosophers he writes, have only interpreted the world. The point is to change it. Our last lecture is entitled Albert Einstein's Relativity as Literature. We tend to think of relativity and literature as two unrelated, even mutually antagonistic and antithetical topics. But the theoretical physicist and the poet are not quite unlike in their ultimate aim, which is to impose order into all experience dinning into our lives. Take the special theory of relativity, for example, which undermined two centuries of classical physics. What problems was Einstein trying to solve? And how did his solution result in nothing less than a reinterpretation of space, 
time, motion, causality, energy, and matter. In other words, a reinterpretation of physical reality. Why is it called the special theory of relativity? And what is so relative about it? But Einstein did not stop there. The general theory of relativity extended the special theory of relativity into a new anti-Newtonian universal theory of gravity in which the same space, time, motion, matter, energy, and force became types of relationships instead of the absolute entities they were in Newtonian physics. I guarantee you that this will be an exciting lecture and it will all be based on long confirmed experimental testing through astronomical observations that have predicted the existence of neutron stars, galactic lenses, and black holes. Sir Isaac Newton, in a letter to Robert Hooke, said, If I have seen farther than other men, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. English 12 invites you to stand on the shoulders of giants of world literature. Welcome to English 12.